Welcome back. Trust the Prophets here. Please like and subscribe. This is Doubling Down. I am your host, Colin Sheehan, and uh, I am humbled. This game is very humbling, as we all know. And the last two weeks have been humbling for me as for, uh, look, I don't hit many of these doubles. One for two, is, is I feel good about. I Hopefully, I can give you at least one opinion. The last two weeks, we've gone 0 for 2. So we certainly want to change that. But first thing I have to play for you is I started this show. This is episode 88, and we have another new voice for you. As I've told you, we always try to get some new voices to hear other handicappers' opinions. And I have a local connection coming on. If you're in the New England area, you'll certainly know my guest tonight. But this show, this channel, I've met so many people over the internet. Something that when I was growing up, you did not dare do. You did not meet people on the internet. And on Monday night, we had a live stream. And we had a moment that uh, was just absolutely electric. And I'm going to play the replay for you. I hope it plays here for you uh, to show you that, yes, we're gambling. We love this sport so much. And it's moments like this that make it so much fun. So here's what happened Monday night on the Assiniboia Downs live stream right here on Trust the Profits. Classic high five. We're going to do uh, ice cold. Uh, high five, Tim. There you go. Let's do it. Six. Six, one, eight, five, four. There you go. That was fast. Come on. Come on, Get up, by. Get up, by. Pass them both. Pass them both. Get up, eight. Come on, six. Get up, eight. Get up, eight. Get up, eight. Six, one, eight, five, four. Get up, eight. 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 <laughs> How do you like that? Are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> that was the greatest moment in Super High Five, whatever the hell the bet's called. The history. There you have it. Just uh, uh, the excitement that you saw uh, from all of us in that moment was so much fun. And so that's why. A, come join us on the live streams. Those two guys, Tim and Sean, I popped in this week. They continually put up, if not positive nights, you're not losing your bankroll. We have a $100 bankroll, and they know how to manage it. And most nights, it's winning. I walked away with 100 bucks last week, so uh, can't complain about that. But we turn our attention to Pennsylvania for the Pennsylvania Derby at Parks. Uh, Anna, Anna uh, Torpedo Anna also running in the Cantillion. Uh, that's where our focus will be for this week's Doubling Down. Again, I mentioned I have a very special guest. Let's get right to it. We didn't plan our wardrobes, but uh, Mutt pops on. And look at this. We've got, uh, I had to wear my Suffolk Downs hat for Jessica Paquette and uh, Mike Manansky, uh, my local friend up here in the Boston area, has his Suffolk Downs shirt on. Who will be at? The Pennsylvania Derby this weekend. First of all, Mutt, thank you so much for joining. Uh, thank you for having me. And well, since you mentioned Jessica Valcat, I will mention her as well. I, I am only going to be there at Parks because uh, last year she reached out and uh, she went to the powers at Bia Parks and said we want to bring Mutt in to handicap some races. And uh, I'm lucky to go back again this year, uh, be part of their broadcast crew, unbelievable crew they have there at Parks doing their in-house TV. So I'm looking forward to that. And by the way, Jessica Valcat, our friend from. Suffolk Downs gave me this shirt. I thought it'd be funny. We're a Boston show. You're a Boston guy, New England ties, and you've got the Suffolk Downs hat on. So we love Jess Paquette. Thank you, Jess. We both need uh, new Suffolk Downs gear, by the way, Jess. So if there's any boxes left somewhere over there <laughs> at, the, at the racetrack, we could both use new stuff. So we didn't plan it. Hopefully it's a good sign for our bets tonight. Hopefully. Yeah, she's hoarding it somewhere down there, traveling between uh, up here in Pennsylvania. So hopefully she's got something for you. And hopefully you guys have some of the excitement that we just had on that live stream Monday. How was that? Yeah, I will say it's funny you played that because one of the themes that I've been thinking about a lot with racing, Colin, is the coverage of it on, on TV. Yeah, NBC spends a lot of money to, to broadcast races. Fox Sports has jumped in big time. Obviously, TVG FanDuel. They need more stuff like that. You know, and I, I don't know how to tell the racing executives this, that it can't just be prattle, opinion, commercial, prattle, on track, uh, race, heartfelt story, as you said, sort of off the air. Like, it's become a little too monotonous. We need more stuff like that. We need people. It, it's a betting game. Horse racing is a great game, but at its core, it is a betting game. It is nothing without guys like Colin and Sean and Tim on a live stream firing away. At a bet, he at the end, he didn't know what the bet was called, but
but he knew he hit the bet there at the end <laughs> at 86 to one racing executives. We need more of that stuff because we are betting at home. We want to watch people that are betting with us. So I, I hope that racing executives see that, see what Barstool has done and try to do more of that. Try to add more of the betting excitement to it, Colin. Cause I think the racing coverage is great. The high def is great, but it is a betting game. What you guys had on Monday, that was a great moment. Next time you have an 86 to one uh, bet that you like, you can text me or, or DM me, please, so I can get in on the action. Please. I need yeah, it. Absolutely. Need absolutely. It. And that's that the, the people up in Assiniboia Downs know how to do it. They treat us right. Yeah. They allow us to share their stream. Even as hard as you know, know how hard awesome. it is just to get these tracks to let us show their stream. So we have yeah. moments like that. And Assiniboia Downs and Woodbine, they they support our channel and allowing us to do that. And that's some of those great moments that we have. Awesome. Um, but, you, uh, you know, I know you've kind of been the local horse racing guy around here, the one and only that I've that I've followed along. And you've got uh, muttstack.com where I know you're putting yeah. up some great info. Um, but not only what you're doing now, how did you get into horse racing? Yeah, it's a pretty boring story. Like I, I went to UConn and Source, Connecticut and cup senior, junior and senior year. We'd go there and play five dollar blackjack on the weekends. It was so close to Mohegan Sun, actually, uh, from UConn. And I remember one of my buddies just took us to the race book because they had very affordable drinks at that time for college kids and show me the racing form Colin. And it looked like I was a huge baseball like nerd as a kid. And I love baseball cards. And it turns out the PPs look like baseball cards. And it was just the, the second I started looking at the numbers and started asking questions, like I was hooked and the timing was crazy. So two years later, my first trip to Saratoga for opening day with my boss at that time, a radio guy from New Hampshire, at the Travers that year, uh, uh, next year, Derby trip to go cover the Derby for a small station, New Hampshire. And I was just absolutely positively hooked. And I've been up and down with like how much I've been into it. Uh, there's been years where at Aqueduct, I have my own trip note notebook. I can still have it from old trip notes I took. Uh, there's been some years where I'm only playing on Saturdays and Sundays because when you have kids, as you know, the yes. time is limited. And I do think the more time you have in this game, the, the more effective you are handicapping because you can put more work into it. But basically, it looked like baseball cards. You could gamble on it. And I thought there was an edge with the work you put in. And that was enough for me. And it's been, you know, 20, 25 years. Been lucky to do some very cool stuff with, uh, you know, on radio, some TV, parks, Mohegan Sun. Like it's been, it's been a blast. And I still, the game needs some changes. It needs help, but I still love the game today in 2024. Yeah, those of us that have that passion and that love, uh, it's something you can't really explain. We try to, and I brought some friends up. I brought a, my friend's first time to the track was the Belmont Stakes at Saratoga this year. And oh. we drove, we're driving on the way home and he said, uh, is this going to be back there next year? I goes, I either want to come again or I want to go when you go Whitney weekend because that's my trip. Uh, oh, that's and, awesome. And we, when you could spend three days with someone and they're really invested in it and they're intrigued by what's happening, they walk away going, oh, this is, this is pretty cool. And it's how do you get that message to folks? Because um, that's what will help this game continue to grow. But for those of us, like us on that stream and like you and like me, uh, it, it's just in our blood and, and we love it so much. And so um, what, where are you at now? What can people find your content? Yeah. And one thing I'll say about that, but again, one of the issues racing has the, a lot of these smaller tracks that you can go to for the first time, they're just going away. You and I were talking before you came on the air. Like if you had told me 20 years ago that Rockingham and Suffolk wouldn't be there and you have to drive to Saratoga from Boston to see your the one local racetrack that's not harness racing, I would have said you're insane. I also would have gone to those tracks every day because I miss live racing so much here locally. So those smaller tracks closing does affect the newer fans coming in. Different topic, different day. Uh, Muttstack.com is a free newsletter. I write about Boston sports, Boston media, horse racing, sports betting. Every Friday, it is free. Muttstack.com, subscribe. And on days like Saturday, I do full card handicapping. I'll have a, uh, an extra post on Saturday. Go through the entire uh, card for, uh, uh, I call it, Cotillion Day, but I guess it is Derby Day technically uh, down at Parks uh, and writing there both Fridays and then big race days uh, on Saturday. So mudstack.com, it is free. Uh, check it out and hopefully you'll, uh, hopefully some winners at some point in this uh, fall racing season. You've got them. I've read, I've followed along. So he has them in there. And we're going to look at we're going to look at, uh, as you mentioned, parks this weekend. Yeah. You know, the cotillion is uh, Torpedo Anna coming in is the big story. But I, I think we both think that even if she has a bounce from the Travers, she's she's still going to beat this field, I would think. And so we we decided to move on to use the last two legs, uh, last two races on Saturday for the Daily Double. Um, anything you want to add about Torpedo Anna? Is she just a, a you single and you move on? You don't even think about it? 
For me right now, yes. Um, even off the bounce, you said, as you said in the Travers, her numbers still put her in the driver's seat. Um, the, the two horses I thought could potentially be uh, maybe a thorn in her side were the two outside horses, Gunsong and Mystic Lake. I mean, Mystic Lake, you know, ran, went wire to wire in that, uh, you know, race out in Charlestown. Uh, and I like Gunsong going back to that Preakness weekend where everyone liked her. Um, she was bet down big time off that morning line. But I thought those two were the most interesting. But I think she's going to sit a great trip. I think those two are probably the speeds in this race going a mile and a 16th. I thought Torpedo Anna could sit right off those two. And given the way she's run recently, um, she's going to be very, very, very tough to beat. I, I, other than she's going to bounce, other than this is too many races here, you know, back to back to back to back. Um, but, I, but to me, those aren't, those aren't working for me as reasons why she might lose when her numbers just, Colin, are so much better. And I, I, I'm, I'm sure people are going to bet Tarifa for Brad Cox. I think this horse wants to go shorter. Maybe a nice prep the seven for a long race. She won't be on my tickets at all. But basically, yeah, I think in the 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 mandatory pick five they have there uh, on Parks uh, Pennsylvania Derby Day, I am unless the track is like showing us some crazy bias on Saturday that makes you want to go there. Um, I, I'm going to be singling here, and and maybe I'm just maybe I, uh, I'm deferring, maybe I'm copping out, maybe there's some more handicapping, but. I think she's a massive standout, obviously. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time personally trying to beat her in this spot on Saturday. Yeah. And the one thing for me, while it could be a bounce off the Travers, you know, and you mentioned the many, how many races she's had but in those races prior to the Travers, she really didn't have to do a lot of effort. To, no, to that's win. CCAO. I mean, she's just, cruise uh, control. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. It was just holding her back, basically. So that's why we'll start off this week's Daily Double with the. I guess marquee event, although to me, seeing Torpedo Anna hit the track this year, um, she she is the the big story. I wrote a story about her on Nesson.com going into the Travers. She just barely got there, and she's so exciting. So for the very least, kudos to you being around the paddock to be able to see her. But let's let's dive into this mile and an eighth uh, dirt race, the Pennsylvania Derby, the grade one. It's for three-year-olds. We do get a little bit of st star power in here. Uh, for those Fairweather fans, they'll remember Seize the Gray or Preakness winner, maybe even Uncle Heavy if you follow the Derby Trail. And then you've got a couple, um, you know, I call them up and comers of Dragoon Guard, who's who's reeled off four wins in a row, and Unmatched Wisdom, who had a had a big performance up at Saratoga. Uh, where did you end up in the Pennsylvania Derby? Yeah, so my stand in this race is certainly I'm going to be against Seize the Gray, and for a couple reasons, he will not be on my tickets. First and foremost, I. I I loved him on Derby Day when he ran in that, was it the uh, Pat Day mile? And yeah, I bet on that day on the cutback and thought, this is it. He's figured it out. D Wayne knows what he's doing. We're going shorter. And since then, they've just continued to, to run him long. And I thought he caught a huge break in the Preakness when that Bob Baffert horse did not go from the outside. I know he had a fast a pace figure early in that race, according to time for him. But I thought he had, all for all intents and purposes, a pretty easy lead, went wire to wire. Since then, to me, he's proven he does not want to go this distance. So, I'm going to be easy, easy fade for me. I love the fact that my racehorse people will be there talking to the folks around parks. The second that this horse was pointed there, they started selling tickets in hotel rooms. Like they're going to be everywhere. Okay. My racehorse people, they're going to be there. They're going to bed. He's on delay. He is not for me. Uh, I'm going to use two horses pretty actively uh, in the, the double that we'll talk about here. The number seven, you mentioned Dragoon Guard, um, super trainer, Brad Cox, like everything this guy puts on the track, everything. Uh, is liable to win. And this horse has been in raging form. He won the West Virginia Derby pretty easily. He won the Indiana Derby pretty easily. Like you look back at his entire year, going back to that uh, second race, that, that maiden breaker at Keeneland going seven furlongs. Uh, he has looked like one of the really good horses in the Brad Cox barn. He's got so many, Colin, that this is like his second tier. But we saw this with Saudi Crown last year. Saudi Crown was the second tier, came in and won the race in the slot pretty easily. There's a scenario where Dragoon Guard uh, is just part of the early pace and it's just too much. No one can catch him, and he legit wires this field. And if Speed is playing really well uh, in, on Saturday at Parks, I think Seize the Gray goes to the front. There'll be some other speed with him, but Dragoon Guard can sit right off and power home. He's a fun horse to watch run. You won't miss him. He's big, gray, and white. He's fast. I think he's one I have to use even at that morning line of 9 to 5, although – Again, the morning lines at parks sometimes cannot be the best barometer of what you might get when they go in and finally when the gate breaks. So keep an eye on the, the odds during the course of the day. You will see some overlays on horses on Saturday that you shouldn't get. So keep an eye on those horses as well. 
Uh, the other horse I'm going to use, and I would use both these as my A's in the late pick five, I would use these as my two horses in the double, is Unmatched Wisdom. And I was much more excited about Unmatched Wisdom before I started looking at sharp handicappers across the country. Everyone, everyone is picking this horse. I feel like he is not going to be anywhere near eight to one. He'll be four to one, seven to two. And even at that price, I can still bet him. Uh, he has looked like, again, a really good horse since his debut uh, back in May. And I can make his use for the Travers. I, I thought that Travers start is a little bit underrated in terms of the trouble that he had there, kind of pulled early on in that race, never really settled in, in my opinion. And it was never going to go past Fierceness, Anna, or Sierra Leone. Uh, I don't want to say he got wrapped up on late. Uh, but I thought there was a lot more expected of that horse going into the Travers. And since then has worked well, gets Flavian Pratt as a board for all three wins. And so it, it's a competitive field. It's a big field. I, a couple other small opinions. But in terms of actually picking two horses to move on here uh, as A's in the pick five and as A's in my double, it's as easy as seven and eight for me. We're not getting eight to one on a match wisdom, but um uh, Chad Brown is, I think, in a pretty good spot to take down a grade one uh, here in a three-year-old race here. I think the last grade one for three-year-olds, straight three-year-olds, will have all year in this country. Yeah, and I, I can't disagree with anything you said. I think you, you've you put some uh, thoughts out there that are exactly what I was thinking. The one thing that you had mentioned that I maybe take case with, and it it wasn't enough for me to leave Dragoon Guard off of my ticket, but I feel like he's had it fairly easy on the front end a couple of times. And I think he's going to get a lot more pressure in this race, uh, maybe from the two, the three, the six, uh, and the eight, who might all want to be a little bit more forwardly placed. And if some of that pressure between these two horses, the seven and the eight, right? I want to use both of them. Yep. If both of them go at it and a couple of those other horses mix in, you know, I always go by the, the edicts that two horses in the speed duel, but three is. Yep. And if you get three horses on the front end, you know, it's not unreasonable to think that one of these is going to maybe come back. And if one of them does come back, there's a horse that I want to come from off the pace who I'll talk about in a second. Uh, so I am going to use the seven and eight. And I'm going to give you a stat here that you can use on Saturday. You can you can you can credit me. All right. Uh, Race Lens here does something pretty cool. And I, and I was thinking about Torpedo Anna and that bounce. And this is what made me come up with this angle. And Race Lens is great at using these angles. I said. Who has run on the grade one weekend at parks that re recently ran in a grade one in the, which their last race was at Saratoga, right? Basically trying to narrow down maybe horses that went from Travers right into the Pennsylvania Derby. And how did they do? Sure. So you run the angle. It's parks grade ones from spa grade one. Now it's not always going to be the Travers. I couldn't get specific on which exact race it was that they were going to be coming back from. Right. But yep. over the last four years, there hasn't been many, so it's a very small sample. You take that with a grain of salt, obviously. 15 starts. Only one horse has been able to make that jump from a grade one race at Saratoga and come in and win uh, on the grade one weekend at Parks. And that horse, if you search by official finish, was Clary Air in 2021 <laughs> going into the Cotillion. There right? Go. So it's got me thinking, looking at that unmatched wisdom now, that's a only that's a pretty big jump to come over, but I think you have to take into consideration what you just said, which was the horse had some trouble at the beginning. You see that it finished uh what eight uh, how many lengths behind seventh and eight, 18 and, almost 19 lengths back. And, yeah, and that goes to the point of you saying, you know, did he get wrapped up and didn't really use as much energy as maybe some of those others that did coming into this weekend coming out of the grade ones out of Saratoga? Because you're always thinking, you know, how much did they use up? Sure. And winning, winning on uh, Travers weekend. Uh, so with that in mind and with the, the thought process that maybe some of this speed uh, gets gets ju juicy, uh, I'm going to give Stronghold a shot, sired yeah. by Ghost Sapper. Uh, he had some issues in that last race on the first turn. And then on the back stretch, Antonio Fresu was uh, looking over to his right, trying to find some space to get through to make his move. And it was just enough where he had to pause and not get that first jump to catch up to the horse that you just talked about, which was Dragoon Guard. Um, I think that it was enough trouble in the Indiana Derby there to, to maybe give yourself a little bit of a price here. I was surprised to actually see him five, five to two. I thought that was, I was hoping to get a better, better price. Well, and I, but can I, can I say, I think, I think, and again, I've been wrong about this price, trying to guess prices again. It's, it's a exercise of futility. He's, he's outside post position, and I'll give you a stat, courtesy of Ed DeRosa. 
Uh, since 2016, Colin, the double-digit posts at parks going nine furlongs are one for 30 at this distance. So the outside spots have not been good. The rail is 0 for 18 in the same races. So people are going to see the outside post position. They're going to see the, the layoff line, the only one race since that derby. He was kind of a nondescript run in the derby. I thought he ran okay in the derby, being 17 outside and still being part of the pace. So he thought he ran okay. They're going to see he didn't win in his comeback race. Like, I think if you think he, if you like him, I think unlike some horses that I like on this card, I think you're going to get better than five to two. They're going to bet Chad. They're going to bet Brad Cox. Sees the gray is going to get bet. So my very long winded answer, you're getting better than five to two on Saturday. Good. I love to hear that. And I, and I, it doesn't bother me as much with the outside post and part partly he's the only grade one winner in here, I believe winning the center needed Derby. Now it's the center needed Derby is a field of <laughs> actually it's a field of eight this year. So, you know, give that, you know, it's not maybe your true grade one, but uh, that's something I've always paid attention to is if you have a grade one race, you want the horses that have won at grade ones, not necessarily grade threes or, or graded stakes. Um, so I'm going to use those two and I'm going to throw stronghold in. I go a little bit, I'll call them chalky in this race, but I think those are probably your three, three most likely uh, horses. Um, I believe you had used, so those are the only two you're using. You're put together. An I'm going to use those. Uh, yeah. And in, in this double specifically, since I, those would be the two A's that I would use in the late pick five. I, I, I will definitely play the, it's a mandatory payout. I'll definitely be playing the late pick five. I'm going to use as backups. Um, you 11 for sure. I thought uncle heavy was a little interesting. Second off the layoff for butch Reed, who's just so deadly. Did you give any look at all? Cause you mentioned this, the speed in this race, potentially heating up and I probably couldn't use them. I probably couldn't use them as an A. I, maybe it'd be a C for me or underneath in, in exotic tickets. But any look at, at Todd Fletcher's protective as like the one potential deep closer in this race. He cuts back from mile and a quarter. He ran okay two back. He was second, uh, but got a really good time form number in that race. They've always wanted him longer. He had the best pace number and Irad gets aboard. Did, did any note on protective on your end potentially – as a, a decent price to to round out some trifectas. Did he have any notes on protective for you in race lines? You know, I, I had written down he finally gets his win, right? They they yeah finally they, yeah really, I mean off the really turf race weird, one mile and a quarter. <laughs> really weird. Um, you know, starting off with two maiden special weights. He starts off at one hundred thirty six thousand at Saratoga. Then he goes down to Tampa for fifty three thousand and can't get it done there. Goes then they show confidence, put him in a grade two, move him up to the grade three in the Peter Pan. Then they throw him in the Belmont Stakes. So there's obviously a belief there that this horse is extremely talented. Then he finally comes back up at Saratoga uh, and breaks that maiden up at Saratoga in a hundred thousand. Fast time in a fast time that day too. Yeah, fast time. The light. The number for me is a little light uh, going by race lens here of a ninety-seven sure. Equibase speed figure. He did have, you know, I, I kind of have him in that ninety-seven, ninety-eight range. He's going to have to take another step forward. Now that win, maybe that was a, a light bulb moment, but what the note that I wrote down Mutt, um, was it was a race that was taken off the turf. Yeah, it was it was there was the talk like are they gonna put him in a turf race, finally try to get him through? It was off the turf. And he won easy that day with Dylan. He ran slowly. It was a it was a you know short field, yeah, four horse it's field. A four horse field. It was, you it start, was that, yeah. You start to wonder, um, all the horses that scratch were basically turf horses, and he, he to me it's kind of like a <laughs> sneaky little win that I don't I don't want to put as much credit into. Um I would like a much higher price than eight to one. And uh so that I just yeah, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I kept I, I keep thinking it'd be a bigger price because he only has that one win, but it is Pletcher, it is Rapoli, it is Irat. I just thought uh, if you if I was looking for a closer here, uh I thought Uncle Heavy, who did not get a pace in the Smarty Jones last time, might be a potential closer. Uh was gonna need he was wide, he's gonna need a trip uh with Sanchez and Butch Reed. And I thought the five I was looking for a couple of closers because you mentioned before the pace heating up, and I think you're there's some potential to that. Um and I, I, if you're if you're playing trifectas, if you're looking for closers in this race, I would not be afraid to use both the ten and the five. The ten will be a much better price. Uh, has two wins here at Parks, but those are a couple closers that if I'm playing trifectas in that race, I'm not even sure I would. Uh, I would use with uh, the horses that you mentioned, uh, along with the, the the two that I mentioned plus Stronghold would be those. Yeah, three. and I I would prefer Uncle Heavy uh, over Protective in that situation, and for... a much better price too. Okay. Much better price. Yes. Yeah. Yep. So we decided to do the second leg is uh, race 14, the, the oh. get out race, as they like to say. Uh, it's the park sprint for four-year-olds and up going six and a half furlongs, kind of a 
funky distance in my opinion you know usually the sprints are, are six you're adding that little six and a half and that is something that i'll pay attention to you know horses that maybe had success not only at six and a half maybe they've had some success at seven um i had a horse that i really liked in here and that was your number five recruiter Ooh. uh the horse sired by army mule um we being ridden by jamie rodriguez who's had quite a bit of success this horse uh, has raced at the distance with a with a second place finish. Uh, one thing I, I I liked here was the comment lines, and I went back and I haven't watched all of his replays, but I saw a good amount of them. So let's go three back when he reports as a gelding in his first race in 2024. You'll see there that he weakened. Right now you can write that off because it's his first race off of a layoff. Mm -hmm. Comes back in his next race at Monmouth and draws away, winning by seven and a quarter going three wide and draws off in that race. The next race, this is where it really kind of stood out to me, was battling this winner and finishing gamely at six and a half furlongs here at Parks, losing to a horse, my buddy B, who actually ran in the Vanderbilt up at the spot. And I think that that's a sneaky little race that I'm going to key in on, which is that Parks race on August 24th. And I'm going to use both of these horses, uh, the number five recruiter and your number nine my buddy b that'll be the first horse on top for me where did you land on top yeah i had to spread a little more in this race uh i'm just gonna use the seven eight uh i'm i'm gonna play a couple different tickets and and the a's for me here uh would be six three and eleven i i you mentioned i thought for sure maybe the horse you liked would be the number six super chow who's seven to two on the morning line for jorge delgado um i i love races where i think there's a potential for a loan speed like people ask me what type of handicapper are you are you i'm a pace and price handicapper i'm looking for pace situations where you could potentially get a price and i'm not sure we'll get a price here but i, I thought going back and watching super chow's race at delaware that day he stumbled got rushed up and had every reason to fade there at the end uh ran fourth to a horse that has run four consecutive buyers in the 90s keeps winning these you know st these state bred uh, sprint races up and down the atlantic uh, before that, looked really good in the Maryland Sprint. Set the pace in the Carter before getting run down by post time that day. Went wire to wire uh, in the slop at Aqueduct in the Tom's Fool. Uh, Irad gets aboard based on he's he's cross entered at Laurel, but based on Twitter, uh, Jorge Delgado's barn tweeted out that he will be racing here with Irad Ortiz, and I thought there was a great chance the six go wire to wire. So I thought Super Chow. If you ask me for a top pick here, it'd be the six. The other two I would use as A's. The number three twisted ride for Michael Vore. You mentioned the Vanderbilt. This horse ran third in the Vanderbilt, 34 to one. Then came back last time in the forego, another grade one. And just the water was too deep at seven furlongs. Now back in a company that he can run with. He has nine career wins. All nine are at parks. Michael Moore cool. does a great job with runners like this uh, wow. in that Pennsylvania area. And I thought he might sneak under the radar a little bit because he, you'll see seventh by 11 lengths last time out which is a couple races back or one of the best buyers in this field. So the three twisted ride. And then we mentioned Brad Cox earlier and like, there's a million good Brad Cox stats. He's got the 11 top gunner. He doesn't claim a lot of horses, Colin anymore. Um, this is wild. So first time off the claim for Brad Cox, the last year, he is six for 12, 50% with an ROI over $2. Nine of the 12 have finished in the money. Like he is claiming to win. It's for Michael Dubb, who's not you know, shipping a horse into parks to lose races. Flavian Pratt sticks around on the last day on Pennsylvania Derby Day. It'll be no price. He'll get bet. But I would be sick if we get unmatched wisdom hole in that, in that first leg and I don't have a Brad Cox horse off the claim 50% the last year. So three, six, and 11 on top. And then I use your nine, my buddy B. I thought you made a great point about that last race for my buddy B. I thought he that horse ran great. Uh, on the pace coming out of the Vanderbilt. And the number 10, 90% Maddie, has just been facing better. You know, battle the Nehru, the True North, the Run Happy. Last time, got no pace whatsoever in that jump start. Any sort of pace here today back at Parks. And Jose Lascano can get this horse very close to uh, being involved late. So I'm going to use three A's here, uh, the three, six, and 11, and I will use uh, nine and 10 as backups. I found this race very difficult. I'm going five deep in a field of 11, which might signal I don't have a great opinion uh, in this race, but a hell of a way to end the pick five and this late double. Um, Cause I think it's a competitive race where I wouldn't be shocked if your, your horse recruiter wins. We didn't mention Gordian, not who's got back races that put him in the mix here. So 
I thought a very tough way to end the card. And why I think it's going to eventually, even if, if you like Torpedo Anna in the pick five, I think this thing would pay okay because other races are pretty difficult to hone in on one winner. I don't think it's going to be five favorites winning late pick five on Saturday. Yeah, so good points there on the 11. I am going to include the 11 as well. It's hard to ignore Pratt and the way he rides these days. Yeah, he's um, awesome. He's and, awesome. And so he's absolutely going to be on my ticket. He's seven year old. I don't think he'll get back to the talent that was there long ago, but he's had <laughs> the li- highest lifetime figs uh, regarded, although those were a few years ago. Now, my reasons yeah. against the six Super Chow, I started there. And I, I believe if I, uh, uh, Race Lens, I believe, had this six on top. Uh, let me just load real quick and let's check. Uh, but my reasons against the number six Super Chow. Uh, yeah, see, so it had a 40% winner, and, th- and that is when race lens is pretty accurate, is when it has these high percentage winners 45, 50%. You, you usually can rely on that. That's cool. So yeah. that's where I started when I look at my handicapping, okay? But when I got to them, I found enough reasons that I wanted to go elsewhere, not only because I liked uh, the five recruiter, and if I'm going to use someone like Super Chow, he's probably going to be the only one I put on my ticket in a daily double and just try and hit it a little bit harder. Makes the things sense. that I started to see here, right? And I watched that last race. There was some trouble at the beginning. I don't like to see this drifting late, drifting out bad, drifting out bad, uh, drift every single race. And I went back and watched and, and that what I, okay. So that started my, my opinions against this horse. And then I looked at, he's a even money favorite last race finishes fourth, go back two back. He's even money finishes third, uh, favorite, back on in December and October twice and finishes second and third. So to me, it's just a little bit of a reliability question. Sure. Now, the other thing I'll point out though, is your column right here next to the speed figures. They give you a class rating of what the class of that race was. He's got a 116, a 114 and a 114 in his last three races. So that shows you the caliber that this horse has been running up against. When, as you look at my number five recruiter, his are 105, 106, 107. Um, so, so, you know, so look, I know I'm taking a shot here at a really against a really good horse, but I just thought the, and the other thing I mentioned was, okay, he gets I rat aboard. Maybe I rat will take care of that drifting out and can be a little bit better of a, less of a concern for you. Um, but, but I decided to, to play against him. And if I'm going to play against, I'm absolutely, like you said, uh, I don't, I hate taking shots against horses like that and then missing. So I'll cover myself a little bit, uh, along with number 11, top gunner recruiter and then the nine my buddy b who uh, i think can be out on the front end you know there's a little bit of a concern as far as how horse how good this horse has been on the synthetic um but go back to his very first race puts up a 111 going wire to wire on the dirt at mountaineer uh um, and, and, and and to to go back to so you you like recruiter recruiter couldn't get past my buddy being the last race uh and i thought it was it wasn't anything that recruited you I, I thought that he he ran his race he had dead aim my buddy B dug in, and this is a trainer that does not run a lot of horses at parks. This was the first race at parks uh, for this trainer and this jockey. Like they had to come back here in this spot, coming off a big race like that. I totally get it. I'm using the horse, and I, I thought the horse showed some guts uh, as a five year old to hold off what looks like a pretty good horse in Recruiter. I didn't use Recruiter only because, like, again, I was using. I'm going two by five basically. And like you said, you can't play them all. You want to go broke, you know, start playing, you know, a million, you know, of these combinations (laughs) together. Uh, It's an easy way to do it. And I thought, well, if we couldn't get by my buddy B that day, uh, there was more talent today. So I didn't use, but will not be surprised when you cash your double. And I don't. (laughs) Well, we'll see. That's the, that's the goal. Uh, What we should have done was just went ice cold to play off the theme earlier in the show. Uh, Here's our parks daily doubles for September 21st. Race 13 and race 14. I'm going to go 7, 8, 11 with a 5, 9, 11. That'll cost you $9. You got two tickets. Why don't you tell the people what you texted me about how you're going to play these? Yeah, I just think that, and again, many, many more smart people than me have pointed this out. Like, you've got to press your big opinions more. Yeah, you, you just have to do it. And and to me, I would play that that A ticket, you know, three times. Um, and I would play that, that bottom ticket, you know, um, one and a half times, or if you want to play, I play it, you know, or six by three, however you want to do it, it gets close to 50 bucks. You do it that way. Um, and if I had a couple extra bucks to get it to 50, I'd probably press eight, six of my two, my two big opinions would be eight, six. If I was going with my top choices, uh, I, I think you can, again, it's a mistake to play everybody. If you can, if you can take the time to do it, 
press your opinions a little bit more. I think that's a way to make sure when you're right, you get paid for it. Because that's the name of the game is when you are right, you want to break their hearts and take as much out of that track, as much into your account as you can. You want to avoid that deposit button and hit that withdrawal button. And you do that by, I think, pressing up your best opinion. So I'll play those two tickets, an A ticket and B ticket, um, and hope to get a live. Hopefully we're alive after the first leg. I mean, we're you and I are going three deep in a pretty competitive race. So we're we're taking some stands there out of the gate in the Pennsylvania Derby. Yes, I love when we can both win and we have that opportunity. So that's yeah, we do. That's my we biggest do. weakness. Something I'm always working on is playing when to bet your, what is your strongest opinion? I have very good opinions sometimes. I sometimes have a hard time differentiating what is a really strong and good opinion to play versus what is a, sometimes I think it's a good opinion. And I thought Strumman was a great opinion in the Iroquois. And when he was on the back stretch and he was 47 lengths behind, I was putting my head in my hands going, how, why did I tout this horse everywhere thinking I was going to be a genius with a 47 to one horse? He had a good run in the stretch though. So uh, a Strumman is a horse. I think you really have to pay attention to as we move on. Uh, obviously it's very early in the Kentucky Derby trail. It's 47, but, you're, you're, you're not, you don't hold your do not get to hang your head on 47 uh, yeah. to one. If That's you like right. something about 47 to one, I will certainly, after this, uh, after we're done here, add them to my watch list and pay attention next time, just on your say-so, at 50-1 to 1 in the Iroquois last weekend. Yes, very good. But you survived doubling down. Thank you so much. Everyone, if you're mm -hmm. down at Pennsylvania and Parks this weekend, swing by the paddock. Mutt will be yeah. there. Uh, he'll have his picks up on the screen, and he'll be happy to see you and say hello. Uh, as always, I ask all my viewers, please put in the comments, shout-out to Nolan, who is my most – a uh, loyal viewer who comments every single week and watches it all the way till the end. Uh, love you so much. I want to hear from more of you. Throw in the comments, what is your daily double? And do you think Torpedo Anna can get beat in the chat? Until next time, good luck, everybody. Have a great week.